Well, ladies and gentlemen, now with this, it is time for me to move on to our next session, a cluttered ecosystem, a deluge of data, multiple touch points, a few of the challenges for a marketeer for today. Well, in this scenario, how can data be leveraged to build the brand trust? Well, joining us now, we have with us Deepa Kurana, co-founder and CEO we serve in conversation with Ruhel Amin, the senior editor, Exchange for Media Group, in a fireside chat on the topic, Data Moves the Needle from Mass Advertising to Mass Personalization. Well, with this, I'm going to pass on the live page to our gentlemen out here and also to all the ones who are viewing us. Please do drop in your questions in the chat box. We will take it up at the end of the session, if time allows. So, Royal, a mammoth task ahead of you. We've got uh, Deepak with us. So I leave the stage and screen to both of you. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Bhavna. And there's been a great conversation uh, so far, a great uh, power-packed speaker lineup uh, we have. And thank you, Mr. Kurana, for joining us on this uh, important fireside chat where the focus is data. I mean, so much is written and spoken about data that it needs no further introduction. In fact, uh, it won't be wrong to say that this is the data economy we are living in, you know. And, we, and founders and co-founders, the new businesses, they're not driven, they're definitely data driven. So which brings me to this uh, uh, first question. Um, so we have uh, heard and uh, uh, spoken about uh, how data helps businesses reach the mass scale. But here the question is also, how do you make it personalized on a mass level when the personalization is a one-on-one -on -one experience so far, traditionally spoken? So uh, give me a sense of how can data become a mass personalized, uh, you know, an effective tool uh, that businesses can use, marketeers can use. Okay, uh, first of all, thanks um, to the A4M team and thanks Rohil for having me for this discussion. Um, uh, coming to, you know, your point about, you know, how data helps with mass personalization. Yeah. Um, so largely, um, you know, if you probably try to, think at it, look at this piece, you know, from a marketer's objective, you know, and if you were to probably dial back a few years, you would say that, look, you know, from a marketing perspective, uh, we've gone through a phase where it was about mass advertising, you know, um, and obviously, you know, at that point of time, TV print delivered that objective, correct? Uh, increasingly, and and now what has happened is with, with the way digital has participated in our life or we've participating in the digital age okay what is happening is that consumers are developing different tastes consumers are uh, uh, you could probably you know probably say that listen an automobile car manufacturer like maruti could get away with two or three models back in 2000 okay uh, fast track that to 2022 you know i don't even know the count of models they have yeah um, so, and when you go into, you know, similarly, when you go into an apparel store, you go into any, any, any particular area, the amount of choices we have is umpteen, correct? So what does all of this really mean? It basically means that I think by and large, we recognize that consumers are different. Okay. There are variety of consumers. Consumers have taken to a variety of, of, uh, uh, of different tastes and like, you know, fondness. Uh, so if the consumers are creating something, which I would say that there are, there are many micro clusters of consumers today, you can't really probably say that, you know, what, um, there is one type of customer. Okay. There are so many, so many different customer types. Now, if there are so many different customer types, okay, as marketers, and, and that's indication, you know, you know, clearly marketers themselves have produced products, which cater to different target groups, right? Okay. So in many ways, businesses are thinking about mass personalization. They're thinking about not a single product, but thinking about multi products for consumers in the same manner. Marketing is also now moving in that direction and really talking about saying that, listen, you know, let's do mass personalization or let's identify commonality between certain groups of customers, which are relevant for this product of the brand, and then try to weave a marketing strategy around that cluster. So I would say that when you're thinking personalization and, and, and when you're trying to say personalization, does personalization mean only one-to-one -one personalization? Okay, not necessarily. You know, um, in, a, in a context where 
uh, I as a consumer, I am on the on the brand's website and I am personally engaging on the brand store. Maybe there is an opportunity to do personalization there. Okay. But the moment when I when I'm not in a in a brand's personal environment and I'm probably in on, on Facebook or I'm probably on Hotstar or I'm probably on any other app, right? Okay. Uh, at that point, brand is looking at saying that, look, I, I don't need to know this person, but can I probably find a cluster of people who are similar? Okay. And data helps me identify certain clusters so that I can make my marketing efficient. Absolutely. I think finding those clusters becomes the core point of all this targeting. Absolutely. So, um, Mr. Karana, we've also seen that content marketing has become crucial for all brands over the years, especially. Give me a sense of how can uh, brands ensure mass personalization effectively in the context of creative and content. Also, I want to uh, request you to share a few examples of Visa, how they have helped brand tell this story with the content and the creative part of it intact. Okay, got it. So um, let me break, let me um, answer the first part out here that you spoke about content marketing and you spoke about personalization since the topic start about um, the whole discussion started about mass personalization. Obviously, you know, we are talking about content marketing, influencer marketing, which has really taken off. Okay. Now the other commonality and the interesting part about, about influencer marketing or content marketing is Today, what has happened is that what are influencers? Influencers are nothing but uh, a set of people uh, or a particular individual who resonates with a certain cluster of people. Correct? Okay. Uh, so potentially, say, assume I follow Milan Soman's Insta page. Okay. And probably, you know, I'm enthusiastic and I'm fond of fitness. So probably that is the reason I follow him. Yeah. So in many ways, here is an example where there is a persona out there which has a, a following of some form which is having a commonality of interest, correct? So if a brand believes that, look, they, are, they want to drive a message you know, to people who are enthusiastic about fitness and they want to do some content marketing around them, who is the best anchor, okay? Or who is the best anchor to take that narrative to the customers out there? So they would probably go ahead and choose a particular influencer of that form, uh, which resonates, you know, with that purpose itself and try to convey the story via that anchor, right? So now, um, now when you're thinking about these influencers, there are so many different influencers which are enabling content marketing today, right? You know, right? And, and you know, you take any topic, whether it is food, whether it is finance, whether it is travel, whether it is gadgets, you name it, or whether it is beauty, uh, you have different, you know, you have different anchors. It's it's no more, you know, one celebrity or two celebrity giving out your narrative, okay? But now today you are also living in a world where there are enough people who can take your story out, or there are enough content creators who now have their own 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 followings which people can can leverage, or brands can leverage. Right. You know, uh, while we are on this topic of data, uh, there's another part. One is effective targeting and one is delivering, you know, and getting that ROI and reducing that spillage. How can marketers issue? Yes. Yeah, yeah. How Market can marketers? Uh, got yeah. it. I, I got your... Uh, I, How I, can they ensure? Yeah. 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 I, you know, I probably wanted to even address... Uh, the second question, you know, the follow-up point about some examples how VServe has gone ahead and helped certain brands do data-driven marketing, okay? And your other point, which last point was about really that how can brands really benefit or uh, how has marketing become efficient for them leveraging data? Right. Um, uh, so I'll answer that uh, for you. Um, um, so basically, VServe is a platform, you know, where we have deterministic audience data. And we leverage that deterministic audience data to create audience clusters for brands. Yeah. And we cater to various sectors, whether it is FMCG, whether it is BFSI, retail, e-commerce, auto, 
you know, consumer durables, you name it. We, we've created different kinds of audience packages which can resonate for these industry verticals. Okay, I'll give you a couple of examples out here to kind of probably make a, a much sharper sense out of it. Yeah, um, um, we recently ran a campaign for a leading brand like PhonePay, and PhonePay was clearly looking at uh, general insurance. So they were really looking out for consumers who would be interested in general insurance. Yeah, they were looking out for people who are likely to go in for auto insurance. Uh, you know, whether it is a two-wheeler or a four-wheeler per se. So they really wanted to reach out to people who are possible car owners or two-wheeler owners, right? So that is the, the problem statement out here. Now, what VSERV did was, VSERV has deterministic data on consumers where we are able to profile users that these are salaried employees above a particular income level. These are people who have taken a car loan. We have an understanding that, okay, this is the value of their car loan. Okay, oh, and this is the recency of their car loan. Okay, so when we tie in all this together, we are able to create a audience cluster. Okay, and then we are able to create this audience cluster and help the brand reach out to these customers on any platform. Okay, so a brand could come and say that, look, we want to target this audience cluster on Facebook, or we want to target this audience cluster on YouTube, or we want to target this audience cluster on any app which the consumer is browsing, you know? So, so that's really how we bring together audience and platforms uh, so that advertisers are able to uh, reach their target audience. Now, this is a case um, where I took an example of a brand, you know, uh, a FinTech brand, a leading FinTech brand like PhonePay, um, similarly, I'll give you another example from a category like FMCG. Okay, so Epigamia, you know, was really looking out for people who are having interest, who have an who are who are conscious when it comes to food habits, and also have a significant amount of interest when it comes to fitness. You know, uh, their research guided them that look, this is the kind of TG which resonates with Epigamia. So we serve again leveraged. The, the the authentic audience data platform which it has and from the platform we called out users you know who are into fitness okay who go ahead and buy food online buy grocery online and this is how this is how we ended up creating a relevant audience cluster for them and then this audience cluster again was leveraged on the preferred media channel of the brand so that's really how we try to achieve you know a superior uh, targeting for them. Um, in another example, another example, which is um, because when it comes to audience data, we are able to leverage audience data, whether it is for a brand campaign or whether it is a performance campaign. You know, in a performance marketing campaign, Max Life Insurance came to us with a problem statement that look, they really wanted people uh, who would be interested in life insurance products. And their biggest pr problem statement was the leads which they were generating. Okay, uh, for them, a quality lead means someone who has an income of five lakh plus, okay, and is also a graduate. These are two essential criteria for them. So using similarly our audience cohorts, we were able to do significant amount of lead generation for them. Okay, and out of the 100 leads we were giving them, 42% of them qualified as, as quality leads. And the brand had a KPI that look, whatever leads we generate, whatever is the customer acquisition cost, um, uh, our minimum threshold should be at least 40% of quality leads. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is how we were able to then, you know, prove to the brand that leveraging data, we are pouring in quality leads to them. Quality leads to them means, see, if there is junk data going to them, it means it puts a load on the call center, it adds up to the cost of reaching out to the customer. It's an overhead to manage. Right. You know, so through the process, we were able to give them quality leads and hence their subsequent costs were also in check. All right. You know, these which are, also, yeah. yeah, these are some of the okay. ways that, yeah, go ahead. So, so while, while you're talking about building those uh, effective data clusters, you know, it's also reducing spillage, of course, the cost, but give me a sense of uh, traditionally how far, uh, is the adoption of uh, 
these you know uh, clusters uh, in the market uh, give me a sense of that also also what goes on for a lot of uh, getting questions already uh, you know for, on this uh, conversation some are asking that how does how do you ensure that these effective clusters are built what goes into it a little bit of that you know how is research approach uh, uh, you know different from the rest of the players in the same domain no interesting so basically you know uh, so if you look at um, let's say that you know from a uh, 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 when you're talking about data driven marketing okay you know when you're talking about data driven marketing today if you look at the digital landscape okay in the first phase and and i want to probably just say this that data driven marketing is not a new phenomena okay because digital is about data right from the very beginning mm -hmm. it's just and and obviously in the first wave you know large players like google and facebook okay because you know if you look at the whole digital adoption yeah the way things are have evolved in the advertising world or even in the consumer space world okay you had large platforms you had few platforms who had the reach consumers were spending significant amount of time with those platforms and hence those platforms had the advantage of consumer insights or consumer data fair enough yeah over time what has happened is that this you and i are not just on a google or a facebook correct okay we are going and spending time on ott platforms today if we want to take a personal loan we are on a personal loan app right tomorrow if we are looking at you know buying food from swiggy so we are on another app so so in many ways the consumer is leaving breadcrumbs okay of their deterministic data at multiple places fair enough i i are you getting the flow there absolutely absolutely so what we serve does is that the visa dmp you know goes ahead and partners with such organizations okay where we have deterministic understanding of consumers these are these are platforms who have uh, their first party data mm -hmm. they partner with us and we are able to then build profiles okay from a variety of partners which we call deterministic audience profiles and that's how we are able to create a cross tab okay of a a relevant audience cluster all right okay and then leverage it from a marketing perspective absolutely i think uh, it's so right i think you hop on from one platform to another and you leave, leave your digital footprint of course and and that's how today's you know uh, audiences you know there's also this discussion of uh, ai a big massive you know uh, uh, thing happening in that space if i have point out to a recent industry report has said that the customer experience and innovation uh, in the ai is putting marketers under pressure <laughs> now how far is how far uh, is this true i mean you tell what are your thoughts on it is it happening is the ai conversation becoming so big that it's stressing out marketers no i don't think i i, I don't think anyone is getting stressed out uh there i feel that um i feel that it's a great time um uh, for a marketer for people like us for the entire ecosystem because what what is happening is is that we are all pushing boundaries and trying to bring in more and more technology and efficiencies you know into every part of our lives right okay uh, uh and obviously these are tools you know when we spoke about cloud computing or when we are speaking about ai when we are speaking mm -hmm. about data okay these are nothing but tools or or you know uh, tools which are available to the marketer you know whether it is the marketer themselves building it out or whether there are uh, partners like us who provide an end to end stack to them yeah so i don't in the first place believe that someone needs to stress out there yes it's a great time where the whole ecosystem uh, is participating very very actively okay uh, and such efficiency when it is brought together and executed well okay you know finally goes ahead and says that like this is this all of this put together is helping a marketer or a business generate a business outcome you know so i i i think that there is a need i would just probably say that the good part is the good part is that today uh, maybe maybe some people are under an artificial pressure 
you know, to do things very quickly. Okay, you know, uh, but I will out of time, you know, and 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 obviously, you know, we are also in an ecosystem where quality talent is limited. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, so when you are trying to manage your resources and capital is also a finite thing, finally for every organization, you know, so there are there are there are those uh, levers which have to all fall in place. You know, some organizations may have the capital, but not the resources. Some organizations, you know, may know, you know, may have the know-how, but not the resources to really scale things up. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So here's another part of it. You know, I mean, we all, most of us uh, have been touching this conversation that, you know, how data ensures a better uh, customer engagement across platforms. Much has been, again, written and spoken on this. But given that you are, very much the skin in the game is more deeper here. Uh, if we look at the recent uh, uh, couple of years and how customers are behaving, looking at data, how marketeers are looking at data, what are your uh, insights that you have gathered which you could share with our uh, listeners here? See, I think um, if I if I if I got your question right, you know, um, a in the first place, I think businesses. I would probably say that. Like from a visa perspective today, you know, our experience in the journey has been that marketers have been working with us, okay, to exploit the opportunity of alternate data, which can be leveraged for targeting. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's, you know, in many ways, we are like a category creator for alternate data in the Indian market, you know. So we are basically, you know, we've seen across categories how the kind of FAQs we receive from marketers, okay, um, um, are things about, okay, you know, uh, tell us how these segments are created, tell us the authenticity of these segments, you know, tell us how you will deploy it, you know, tell us how we can measure the business outcome once we go ahead and, and leverage these segments, right? And then a variety of our partners, you know, are able to experience, you know, the campaign outcomes for them to really see proof in the pudding. Yeah, so that's one one use case out there. Uh, talking about uh, data from a customer engagement perspective, you know, there again, marketers. What is happening is that marketers themselves are gradually building first-party data at their end, correct? And obviously, you know, uh, for businesses which are pure digital, those businesses from day zero have customer data, and customer is going to their online store, you know, uh, putting things in the cart, making a purchase, returning the order, responding to an offer, you know. So all those events marketers are capturing in order to build a better understanding of the consumer, right? right. Uh, so all of that understanding as they gradually develop, okay, and they are able to then run, you know, internal campaigns on their own customers, Okay, which then then which in turn provides them a guidance of what is working, what is not working. Right. Yeah. So right. they themselves, so every organization is going through that, you know, learning curve. And many organizations, I would say that, you know, you could say there are some organizations, you know, uh, uh, who've gotten the scale, who've gotten the understanding and who've gotten the whole piece right. But obviously, you know, I, I would still say that it's still very early very early, there is still, you know, uh, because businesses are evolving, consumers are evolving, you know. Right. Uh, uh, so I think, you know, but in that evolution, uh, the good news is that marketers and platforms like us have started to understand how to leverage data. Right. So I have two more questions before I take up some audience questions as well. Um, you know, digital is growing in a very big way. The recent report that we also released, you know, that ADEX is expected to grow over 30% this year, you know. So I want to get your thoughts on digital overtaking print as the second largest ad spend category and eventually taking over TV. Your thoughts on this? How do you see this uh, happening? And I, I think that, you know, I, I think... Um... Uh, the, the way I look at it personally is that, you know, uh, uh, the consumer is spending more time on those digital platforms, 
Okay, so in many ways, the ecosystem is doing a catch up. Okay, we all, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we all follow the consumer, right? And if the data is giving us a guidance that consumers are spending disproportionate amount of their media consumption time, okay, on digital, you know, mm -hmm. hence for those reasons, you know, the ad dollars are going to shift towards digital, okay? Uh, so I think, you know, as far as India is concerned, you know, we would look at India holistically and we would say India is Bharat 1, Bharat 2 or Bharat 3, correct? And all these trends would, when it comes to digital adoption over print, TV or TV adoption over digital, you know, all of this is like uh, fairly heterogeneous and, and operates at, you know, different scale in different parts of the country, right? So if, if you know, so I, I don't think, I, I think the good part is, I would say that uh, clearly, uh, the good news is that digital at least is now at scale, significant amount of scale, okay? Whether it is video consumption, whether it is content consumption, okay? Uh, it's, it's, it's at a massive scale right now. And obviously, if people want to capitalize on that, uh, clearly, you know, people are finding ways in which how digital can deliver to their uh, marketing objectives. Uh, TV will continue to have, uh, I would say that, you know, TV continues to play a good role, an important role, and will continue to play an important role. I think from a media perspective, I just probably feel that, you know, TV will be a strong uh, uh, participant in the ad dollars. And obviously, TV and digital would probably be, you know, going head to head when it comes to split of ad dollars. Absolutely. So, which also, you know, while there is a lot of growth and we know that digital is growing and going to grow further, but the next uh, level of growth is, you know, what, what will fuel that growth in your view? You know, what are the particular trends that would fuel that growth? See, I think, um, see, already there are a lot of existing trends at play, you know. So, when you look at digital, obviously, the way uh, the payment ecosystem, the digital payment ecosystem has expanded in the country, um, the content consumption, the smartphone devices, there are lots of macro trends right now at play, lots and lots of macro trends at play. Okay, so all of this cumulatively, you know, is a driving force. Uh, so I think already we, uh, it's a very, you know, when, you, when you're looking at consumer habits, uh, three, four years back to, you know, when you compare the consumer habits three, four years back to 2022, you know, uh, we already talking like significant amount of shifts, right? You know, you're talking about uh, OTT consumption, you know, when it comes to long format content consumptions, that's gone through the roof. You know, when you look at even sectors like education, the adoption of education online, again, is a huge shift in the consumer behavior right okay so there are there are many such examples out there you know where we are talking that many of the many of the essential discretionary or entertainment led needs of customers or shopping you know are gradually moving in the digital world so as right. all these macro trends are at play okay i think we are now at a place where what you say that uh, we are in a very, very hyper growth stage. Right, right. Great. Uh, so I want to bring in a couple of audience questions. I'm getting a lot of requests. The first one is from uh, Nitin T. And he's asking uh, how much of this growth is fueled by a small town uh, and challenges when targeting this audience, the Bharat 1, Bharat 2 audience? See, I think um, if I could... Um, understand um, the, you know, understand the point. I think what the question is really about that, is there a challenge reaching to Bharat 1, Bharat 2? Is, right. is that the question? Right. How yeah. much of that is fueling the, already in the setup, how much of that Bharat is fueling the growth of the next phase? I think clearly, clearly when you talk about digital adoption, we are talking about digital adoption, like whether it is the metros or Bharat 1, Bharat 2, Bharat 3, everywhere, Right. Okay, there is massive digital adoption happening out there. Um, we ourselves, 
as a platform have profiles for over 550 million users you know so a large part of our user base is representing bharat 2 and bharat 3 yeah uh, um, so i don't think like when you look at even payment adoption in the country yeah we are mm-hmm. really talking about you know payment adoption happening across india right or when you're looking at e-commerce adoption when you talk about you know d2c businesses okay who are selling things to consumers whether they are in the fashion space beauty space or whether it's an e-commerce portal all of them are getting that growth because finally see digital is a big equalizer right. let's see that right digital is a big e- equalizer and obviously you know uh, 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 you could probably say that you know you know when when you're talking about uh, the population in India, there is still a handful of people who live in metros. So, mm-hmm. so clearly the growth is going to come from where the numbers are. Okay, great. Well, I have one final question, which is, you know, um, the name is not given. Uh, you know, each, uh, you know, you witness data trends. Data is so fluid, you know. The trends are also fluid. What is the shelf life of a data um, point, you know, in terms of capitalizing on that trend according to you? Is, is there something like that in, in your view? I think you would classify data into different types of data. There could be data points which are perishable, highly perishable. Uh, there could be certain data points which could have a much longer shelf life. Okay. Uh, uh, so you would say that, okay, fine. You know, you know finally from um, a marketer perspective, someone looks at a demographic profile of a user, someone looks at the life stage of that user, and then someone looks at their shopping behavior, correct? Okay. Uh, so there are some, some of these pieces out there. Yeah. Uh, so when you're looking at if, if I'm, let's put it this way, if I'm an insurance company and I want to target people who are graduates with an income of 5 lakh above, correct? So anyone who's in that bracket is relevant to me. Right. right. Okay. Um, uh, so anyone which is an ed tech player, if, if, if Baiju's is an ed tech player and they want to target parents, so then they're really looking at a mix of demo profile. Then they want the right affluence profile. And they also want to know whether, you know, this people, this person out there is digitally savvy to make online transactions or not. Right. So I would say that when whenever we try to look at data we just have to look at the context and say that you know whether i'm leveraging perishable data or whether i'm leveraging some data points which have a longer shelf life right absolutely i think there's a lot uh, that lies you know in this conversation but however we are short on time so i have to really thank you for uh, taking out time and sharing those uh, deep insights and of course the small screen is the place where the big data is coming from and it will come keep coming but thank you so much for joining us on this uh, fireside chat thank you mr khurana thank you so much yeah thank you and uh, thank you thank you for having me yeah bye